and Rhoda Goldman, Distinguished Professor in the Physical Sciences at UC Berkeley. An elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, he is one of the world's most highly cited astronomers and has received numerous prizes for his research. His primary areas of research are supernova, exploding stars, active galaxies, black holes, gamma ray bursts, and cosmology. He was a member of both teams that use both teams who used observations of supernova to discover the accelerating expansion of the universe, which was honored with the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics to the team leaders. Winner of the Top Teaching Award at UC Berkeley and voted the best professor on campus a record nine times, he was selected as the National Professor of the Year in 2006. He has produced five astronomy video courses with the great courses, wrote an award-winning college textbook, and appears in numerous TV documentaries, including about 40 episodes in the Universe series on the History Channel. And I'll introduce Scott uh, once he shows up. Uh, <laughs> I'm pleased to also uh, introduce Ariel Waldman in the middle. Our Ariel is the founder of spacehack.org, a directory of ways to participate in space exploration, and the global coordinator of Science Hack Day, an event that brings together scientists, technologists, designers, and people with good ideas to see what they can create in one weekend. She also is an interaction designer and research affiliate at Institute for the Future. Previously, she worked at NASA's CoLab program, whose mission was to connect communities inside and outside NASA to collaborate. Her website is arielwaldman.com. I'm going to start by asking each panelist to give, uh, in this order, a short three to five minute uh, exposition of their initial thought on this, and then we'll open this for Q&A from the audience. I think that the next revolution in science is going to come about as a result of exponential technologies like artificial intelligence and the massive data analysis that will result from the kind of processing power that we're going to have in the future. Artificial intelligence is not just a big bag of problem solving techniques, however powerful. It is an amplifier for other sciences and technologies. The great Greek mathematician and physicist Archimedes said, give me a place to stand and a lever long enough and I shall move the world. And artificial intelligence can form a fulcrum that provides leverage to other sciences and technologies. If you look at a picture of the Earth from space, you don't see any separate countries. And if you look deeply into nature, you don't see separate disciplines. And yet, all of the disciplines are exploding in knowledge. The scientific disciplines are not just exploding in big areas like medicine, but in sub-disciplines like genomics or RNA interference, sub-sub-disciplines. And yet, the human brain has not had an upgrade in over 50,000 years. That's a bit of a problem. We're facing a tsunami wave of exploding information with an ancient architecture. Major limitations of bandwidth, processing power, memory fidelity, and plenty of well-documented bugs in human cognition. <laughs> so no human, no matter how brilliant, can master the accelerating wave of science and technology knowledge. And that's why I often tell my students, never send a human to do an AI's job. <laughs> In truth, the mastery of the accelerating wave of human knowledge is going to take a collaboration between humans and AIs. But one of the things that we'll see happening as part of the revolution in science to come is that AIs will be used to revolutionize education will have not just one laptop per child, but one tutor per child or adult learner. 
hopefully we can eradicate science and mathematics illiteracy like we wiped out smallpox. I think that we'll also see the amplification of capability in nanoscience and in molecular manufacturing. And that will dramatically drive down the costs of robotic platforms and sensors and actuators. It will also eventually give rise to an increase in wealth in our society so we don't have to defend puny science budgets and we can actually begin to think boldly once again. Finally, I would just say that artificial intelligence will lead not just to bigger, faster brains, but to truly different intelligences with their own signature strengths and weaknesses. Hopefully, a collaboration with those intelligences will enable us to detect a signal that will be worthy of the SETI Institute's attention. Thank you. Hi, so I'm really excited to be here. I was at the first SETICON uh, in 2010, and I was here as a total fangirl uh, geeking out about all of this. So uh, I am, I, while I'm up here, I'm totally with you in the audience going like, this is amazing. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about the next big science revolution. I guess what I would like to start with is asking you all a question just to think about. Uh, what will you do when space exploration is as cheap and accessible as the web is today. So if you can imagine having access to space similar like you do the web, what might you do? That's a really fascinating question to me. So to me, the next big science revolution is, that's going to be taking place is really citizen science and open science and having a complete renaissance of those. So if you can imagine, even within the next 10 years, what a citizen science and open science renaissance might look like. That's where I'm really fascinated, uh, and that's where I like to spend a lot of my time thinking. I think there are a lot of really interesting signals that are taking place today that are really kind of showing the way to what's going to be happening over the next few years. You're seeing more and more biohacker spaces. So these are spaces where people who do and don't have biology degrees are actually doing biotech and exploring biotech in these hacker spaces. They're not in universities, they're not in government agencies, but they're actually doing it on their own, sometimes in collaborations with different types of people. Um, there's also a lot of uh, work being done around space exploration and making that more accessible, not only in commercial space, but you also have people who are discovering galaxies, being able to control Hubble on their own because they found something interesting in the data. You have all these people who are now being empowered to actually actively contribute to science and space exploration. And some of these people have science backgrounds, but some of them don't have science backgrounds at all. How many of you are familiar with uh, Galaxy Zoo? Raise of hands. Few of you, okay. Uh, for those that don't know Galaxy Zoo, it's galaxyzoo.org and it's a uh, online interface where anyone can go and classify and potentially even discover galaxies that have never been discovered before. <laughs> I find this really fascinating. They now have like over hundreds of thousands of people who are doing this. And the really cool part of this is that all of the data that they use, they originally use data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and now they use data from Hubble. All of that data was already out there, but it wasn't until someone actually built an interface to it that allowed now hundreds of thousands of people to be actively uh, classifying galaxies, and some of them actually finding galaxies, and this has already happened. This is just a really fascinating time to me, and I think you're going to be seeing more and more of this. But not only are you going to be seeing uh, projects where people can get involved in science, but you're going to be seeing people who are actively directing science. And you're going to be seeing people who actually want to explore the fringes of science. So to me, citizen science and open science isn't just about replicating things and democratizing things and making them more accessible. That's definitely part of it. But it's also about exploring unpopular left behind science, stuff that might get left out of bureaucracies, things that might not be on NASA's roadmap. This is the really exciting part 
uh, about this, is actually exploring all these different parts of science and having more people who feel like they can actively contribute to science. And they don't necessarily have to go back to school to do that. So that's what I think really the next big science revolution is going to be. Please. Okay, so just uh, for my brief introduct introductory comments, I wanted to focus on dark matter and dark energy. Of course, there's exoplanets and, and nanotech and, um, you know, biophysics, all sorts of cool things one could talk about, and maybe we will in the Q&A, but I'm an astronomer and I work mostly on dark energy and dark matter, so let me focus on that. Dark matter constitutes something like 23% of the total contents of the universe. And we don't really know what dark matter is. We think that it consists mostly of funny little subatomic particles left over from the Big Bang. The generic name for them are the weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs. Now, they're very hard to detect, and physicists have been looking for them for a couple of decades now and haven't found them. That's okay so far because they're really hard to detect. They hardly interact with anything at all. But if in the next 10 years we find them, okay, that'll be great. We can study them, and that'll be a revolution. If we don't find them, that'll be a revolution as well because it'll mean that we have to kind of go back to the drawing board. Dark matter, that idea will probably be wrong if we don't find the particles responsible for dark matter in the next 10 or 20 years. And it'll be a revolution in science because we'll have to think up some other reason why galaxies are held together and clusters of galaxies are held together and so on. In other words, right now we think they're held together by dark matter. But if we don't find dark matter with increasingly better technology, then it may turn out that dark matter is the 21st century equivalent of a, a, a Ptolemaic epicycle. In other words, it's, it was an interesting idea that turned out to be wrong. Um, so if we find them, that'll be revolutionary. If we don't find them, that'll be revolutionary. And that's 23% of the universe. Then there's 73% of the universe, which we call dark energy. It's what supposedly is causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. All right, we discovered this acceleration in 1998. Uh, it's now widely accepted that the universe is accelerating in its expansion because there's lots of other evidence now besides the supernova data on which we based our conclusions 14 years ago. Um, either dark energy is producing this acceleration or some failure of Einstein's general theory of relativity on large scales. Those are the two competing hypotheses right now. Well, suppose we keep measuring what the properties of the acceleration are, and suppose we keep on finding that the dark energy looks more and more like Einstein's infamous cosmological constant, a property of space that just is and you know, causes space to expand faster and faster. It can be thought of as a in a sense, the, the vacuum energy of space, okay? For a long time, people thought this would be zero, okay? But suppose it's found that the vacuum energy is non-zero and it's truly the cosmological constant. Then I would think this will create a revolution because it will, it will argue even more forcefully or it will add to the arguments that we already have that ours might be just one of a multitude of universes in what we call a multiverse. Because if, if the acceleration is caused by just this property of the vacuum of space, there's no reason I can think of, and people, theorists much smarter than I am have been working on this, there's no reason for them to think that the value of this vacuum energy had to be the particular value that we measure, okay? More likely, it's just a random value that occurs in universes. And if there's a whole spectrum of universes having a, a wide range of values for the cosmological constant, well, we can't possibly live in 
any of those in which the cosmological constant is big because basically stars and galaxies can't form if you have a big cosmological constant. A value of zero for the cosmological constant is very unlikely because out of all the numbers you can imagine, if they're truly randomly distributed, zero is a very unlikely number. So the point is, is to, that if we live in a universe with a small cosmological constant, but one for which there's no physical basis, in other words, it just looks like a random number, the only way I can see that happening is if there's a plethora of universes. In other words, an ensemble of universes spanning the full range of cosmological constants, and we happen to live in one of the universes in which, you know, conditions were conducive to our development. So I would think that um, a demonstration that the dark energy is the cosmological constant would be yet another argument for a multiverse, and that's a true revolution in the Copernican sense because, you know, not only is there our own universe, but it's one of a multitude, and that would be a really cool thought, I think. I mean, it, it's a cool thought already, but it would be cool to have even more evidence that, that this may well be true, though very difficult to prove. So. Uh, can I ask, who, who has the roving microphone in hand? It's, it seems to be making some noises. Okay, you want to keep it steady, please. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to introduce myself uh, as a moderator. I'm, my name is Pierre Schwab. I happen to be on the board of SETI. Uh, being the moderator, I'll take the first question, if I may. And in the title, it says, the next big science revolution. Big science usually means big budget research. Um, at least it can be used that way. Uh, given the fact that uh, we are uh, in uh, austerity times, uh, and we don't have a lot of money to do big science, and, it, and the budget is shrinking. Uh, my question to the panel is, how can we best educate the voters to support big science? So I, I think that the best way to educate voters to support big science is to get them inspired about science and technology. That's what Dean Kamen has been doing with FIRST Robotics. Uh, it's what Alex does when he educates uh, large numbers of people about the significance and the beauty of astronomy. Uh, it's what citizen science work does when people get involved in collaborative science discovery projects. It's what um, the online courses on the web are intended to do to get people involved. Clearly, we have a society that has tolerated science and technology illiteracy for a very long time, and we can't afford it. Because when, when Congress people uh, stop acting like leaders and they begin acting like poll takers, and they're taking polls of people who couldn't care less about science and technology, we're in serious trouble. The good news is that we can make science and technology cool again, and I think we will. Uh, yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. For me, I think the important thing is that it's not only the responsibility of, of everyone to get inspired about science, but it's also science's uh, responsibility to realize that they really need help from all different types of people um, in all different types of industries. And I think science, people in science, not all of them, but a lot of them don't do a very good job of realizing they actually need help from all different types of people. They need help from fashion designers. They need help from people working in mines. They need help from all these different types of people. But for the last few decades, really, the communication has been unless you actually uh, work in science, unless you've pursued a traditional degree in science, that you really can't get involved. And if you do want to get involved, great, go back and get a PhD first. Um, and I just don't think that's very accessible. So I think it's not only about you know, finding ways to get people inspired by science and, and getting them to view science as just another fabric to work with, um, even if that's not their chosen <coughs> career, but it's also science's responsibility to better communicate that they need help from all different types of people and actively seek it out. So it's not just a communication factor, it's also an action factor. 
science institutions need to put more salaries available to have people come in from these different industries and help them. I know budgets are tight and that's probably easier said than done, but I don't think it's any less important and I think it should be paid a lot of attention to. Let me add to what my colleagues said, and by the way, I agree fully with them. Um, government budgets are really tight, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. There are huge uh, things that you know, we have to pay for in society right now. And so although I fully support and you know, wish the government would, would fund science and technology more, I think we have to increasingly rely on private philanthropy. So it's a private-public partnership. And this is beginning to happen. You know, the Keck telescopes were built in the 1990s on, on Mauna Kea Volcano from a, you know, based on a gigantic contribution from the W.M. Keck Foundation, totaling something like $140 million. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has given $250 million to build a 30-meter telescope that the University of California and Caltech are uh, partnering to build with uh, international partners. Uh, you look at what Elon Musk is doing. We heard about that last night with SpaceX. Uh, other, you know, multimillionaires and billionaires can and are increasingly contributing to science and technology, and I, I applaud that. I think more of them should do that. And I think we, you know, we're not going to be able to do big science without the private philanthropy. And each of you, of course, can, can help out in, in small ways or big ways, whatever, whatever you can do and it, it all adds up. But we can't just rely on the government anymore. Yeah, we will now open a question from the audience. Uh, could you please, could you please uh, introduce yourself briefly so that uh, the panel has an idea what uh, angle you may be taking with that question? Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to do a Michael Kreisney on you and, and ask, what is your question? Okay. Is there a question from the audience? Yeah, I'm Mike Rosenblatt, San Jose. The, uh, the big uh, gorilla in the room now is energy. And uh, no matter what else we turn and talk about, that would seem to be uh, something we have to talk about. We're talking about the next big science revolution. Where are we going to get our energy from? What segments of the uh, Earth are we going to get it from? Who is going to pay for it? How is it going to be paid for? Because without the energy, we can't do anything. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, so there are many possibilities, of course, but every day I see this thing <laughs> glowing in the sky <laughs> and it's putting out so much energy, it's just almost unimaginable. 
So I, I know right now it's still very expensive to harness that en energy, but I, I think, you know, that's an obvious source, solar. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add to that, that uh, people who think about solar uh, often, and, and often people who are critical of solar power, uh, point to the fact that it supplies about 1% of the U.S.'s energy needs. But in fact, it's decreasing in cost. Solar photovoltaics are decreasing in cost by about 50% every 18 months or so. And in fact, if you get a number of those cycles going, it's going to be extraordinarily cost effective. Uh, so eventually, we'll see solar and other forms of energy, more traditional forms of energy, uh, price crossing. And when that price performance curve crosses, you'll see solar energy being uh, an amazing and cost effective source. Uh, we have a question from this side of the room. Hi. Um, okay, uh, my name is Jamie. I'm a graduate student in writing. Um, so I, I thought the three possible next big science revolutions you all mentioned are really interesting from like big stuff out in space to something I can do at my computer right now. But I wonder if you could share with us and um, just an idea of what you might have of another potential big science revolution that isn't also the thing that each of you also is working on right now. I just wonder if there's something in a different field that you also think is coming and is big and important and cool. Yeah. One, one, okay. Um, sure. I, I think that uh, synthetic biology is going to blow the roof off of our relationship to uh, cells and our own bodies. Um, the fact is that we can now sequence the entire human body. We can think of DNA as a programming language. Uh, the ability to read that programming language is fairly recent. To read it very cheaply has been fairly recent. But pretty soon we're going to be able to write with that programming language. And that is really going to change our relationship to biology. It's very exciting. Yeah, very good. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> One moment. Aaron, uh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say uh, it's, that's a great question, and I, I think you should push the panelists to expand more all the time. That's a good thing to do. Um, one thing that I think is also going to be a, a revolution, although I think it's, it, it might take some time, it's definitely in its very early stages, is, is exploring the ocean and really understanding the ocean more. I think uh, it's really fascinating to me that we know next to nothing about the ocean. Uh, we haven't even mapped the top millimeter of the ocean. Um, and when I say that, I mean like the top millimeter of where the ocean and the air meet and the fascinating uh, things that take place in that top millimeter. Um, but you're also seeing endeavors like Virgin Oceanic um, that's trying to put humans uh, at, in exploring deep sea exploration. Uh, I find all this really fascinating. I know next to nothing about it. Um, but I think it's just this big blank page that's just waiting to really have people work in it and people explore it more. And I wish more people were. And I think that you'll be seeing a lot more fascinating discoveries coming out of the ocean uh, with time. But again, I think it's very much in its early stages of, uh, of uh, being fully realized. Uh, let me follow up on what Neil said. I think that uh, indeed, synthetic biology and genetic engineering in general are going to be a huge revolution. Um, you know, people are going to find ways basically to cure or largely treat genetically based diseases and, um, you know, extend, extend our lifetimes. And, you know, I'm not sure how many generations we are away from Ray Kurzweil's scenario where all these nanobots infest our bodies and are continually repairing us and then the only thing you have to worry about is not being you know hit by a truck or something otherwise you will have achieved immortality um, but you know that that may not be a generation or two away the way he says it is but it but it but it could be here within you know 10 who knows how many generations and indeed uh, i think our long-term descendants are likely to be computers actually at some point you know because computers could uh, could last much longer and survive interstellar flights and stuff like that. So that's a, that's a big area. Um, 
the, the one that's in the more immediate future and is a little bit closer, again, to my own field, is the discovery of gravitational waves. When uh, two stars merge, for example, or two black holes merge together, ripples in the shape of space and time go flying out. And this effect has been indirectly detected by measuring the orbits of neutron stars orbiting one another, pulsars, okay? But the waves themselves have not yet been directly detected. The direct detection, which I think will happen in the next five to 10 years, will open up a whole new window on the universe because gravitational waves are not yet another form of electromagnetic radiation. They're a different type of way in which to study the universe altogether. So I think that's gonna happen soon. My name is Joe Urban, and uh, I'm a business intelligence analyst. And in my profession, uh, one of the challenges we have is to uh, review the data and to question our assumptions as to how things actually work. So the challenging question I have to you is, what assumptions do you think that we are holding on to, maybe the scientific community, um, that will be challenged or will break down as uh, maybe in the next you know, generation progresses? I would just list one big assumption that I see both in the scientific community and in the lay community, and that's that the future will be more or less like the present, that, th that the pace will be pretty much like the way it's been. And I think that's, that assumption is completely false. We really are undergoing exponential acceleration of science and technology and you're going to, you probably already feel it to some extent when you deal with your iPhones and Blackberries and emails and you sort of feel the tsunami wave of exabytes of information washing over you. But that will double in 18 months and that will double in 18 months. And uh, pretty soon you'll, you'll start feeling the excitement of being on an exponential curve. Yeah, I, I would just say one of the assumptions that needs to really be broken down, um, and I think will be broken down, is the concept that citizen, citizen science and open science is cute, or it's a toy, or it's something, you know, that, oh, it's really great that we're letting everyone participate, but, you know, they're not really contributing to science, and, oh, that, that, that scientific discovery they made, I, it, was, it was cute, but it doesn't really get cited in any papers, and you know, that is going to go away. Um, people, there are many people who still feel that way, but it's getting broken down already. You already have people who are making actual amazing scientific discoveries that do get cited in a lot of papers. Um, and it's just very disheartening to see people who uh, either want to attack people because they get a lot of publicity. So citizen science and open science gets a lot of publicity now, and so you see scientists making the assumptions that, oh, they're just very good at PR, but they're not actually doing real science. Um, that assumption is going to be really broken down and deinstitutionalized more and more over time. Um, actually, uh, it was exciting to hear uh, Alex talk about gravitational waves because there is a project called Einstein at Home, which is a project that you can get involved in uh, to actually help try and detect uh, gravitational waves. Um, and so this is something that anyone can get involved in. And how cool would it be if this project actually uh, detects them? It would be amazing, and as, as he said, that's one of the next big science revolutions. So these are things that are being democratized that anyone can get involved in, and so I think anyone who's calling this cute or a toy um, really needs to be prepared to have most people arguing against them in, a, in the next few years. So the, the only thing I can say is that, um, regarding assumptions and stuff, sometimes I wake up screaming at three o'clock in the morning worrying that dark matter and dark energy are the 21st century Ptolemaic epicycles.
generic or the ideas of the, the, uh, the citizen scientists and things like that? How can we energize the future of education? I'm, I'm just going to give you a quick answer and turn it over to Ariel. Um, I, I think that you're right. We shouldn't cede the ground of um, educating the population about science and technology to the private sector. But I think that Alex's point was well taken, that we can't just always assume that it's going to be government funding for science and technology that's going to uh, get us where we need to go. And in fact, um, if you look at educational initiatives today, the most exciting educational initiatives often come from the private sector. And the things that, uh, and they often are funded by people who've made a lot of money in the private sector, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's really a very good thing. Uh, education has been in the doldrums for a very long time, and we need to disrupt it. And the good news is we've got the technology to disrupt it. We have the World Wide Web. We have AI that can provide individualized tutoring. We have massive amounts of data that we can use for predictive analytics. And I think we're in great shape to disrupt education. I find education to be a really fascinating topic right now just because there is so much focus placed to doing just that, disrupting it. Um, that said, in the meantime, there are really exciting things also taking place. Uh, some of you may have heard that DARPA recently gave a grant to the Maker Faire uh, people, uh, people who are making interesting things. And so there is a makerspace grant given from DARPA uh, to create maker spaces, places where kids can actually build things and explore different ideas by actually um, doing something as opposed to just studying something. And so these maker spaces are going to be built out in schools uh, across the US um, over the next few years. That program is already getting started. Um, that's fascinating. DARPA has also given money to hacker spaces to explore space exploration. So that's also really great because that's not only, so not only are they giving money to uh, traditional education to kind of make it better, but they're also giving money to hacker spaces, places that kind of exist outside of the traditional institutions and are more about community learning. Um, so there are good things happening. Um, I think more people need to kind of uh, take DARPA's lead on that. DARPA is, uh, you know, it's the advanced section of the DOD for a reason. Um, people need to kind of view themselves in the government as, as doing more advanced and progressive things and giving grants to people who can actually make things happen, um, both inside and outside the traditional education system. So I, I, I'm never one for voting uh, one or the other. I, I think you can have both. Um, and I think the government does need to pay uh, money to both sections. Alex? I'll pass on that one. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, my name is uh, Ricardo Vigil. I'm a PhD candidate student at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, professor, can you explain how the dark energy content uh, number, the 73%, is derived or calculated? Yeah, so how is the dark energy content, the 73%, calculated? It's from a, a number of different measurements that simply put, give you two or more equations into unknowns. So if you know that x plus y equals one number and x minus y equals another number, then you can get both x and y. And to make this a little bit more concrete, the supernova measurements give you the difference between the gravitationally attractive stuff of the universe and, in a sense, the, the gravitationally repulsive stuff. That's the x minus y. Uh, and that's negative 0.4. Okay? And measurements of the microwave background radiation, the WMAP map and things like that, the COBE map going back a couple of decades now, give you the geometry of the universe. The overall geometry of the, of the universe is flat, that is Euclidean space works, gigantic triangles have the property that the sum of their interior angles is 180 degrees, blah, blah, blah. So, so aside from the presence of stars and black holes and galaxies, if you average over all that, the properties of space are that it's flat and Euclidean. And that, through general relativity, requires the total matter plus energy density of the universe to be one in some units. So dark matter plus dark energy equals one. 
dark matter minus dark energy is negative 0.4 to one significant digit. That means the matter is 0.3 and the dark energy is 0.7. Uh, so I think that event uh, uh, is going to be the fact that currently on NASA's roadmap, we are supposed to be uh, within, a, a human is supposed to be in the orbit of Mars by 2033. That's pretty exciting and it's not widely communicated because I imagine the dates as always can move a little bit. Uh, but just even being in the orbit of Mars by 2033 and hopefully then getting to the surface of Mars after that with a human, I, I do think it's a big enough event. I, I think people want to you know, talk about how, oh, we've, but we've already been to the moon, it's not gonna really ignite and you know, people have lost interest. Um, I think that's not true at all um, and I will laugh in their face when I see everyone being really excited about it. it um, uh, I, I, I do think Mars is, is the next thing that can really, um, capture people's imagination. I, I know that we're supposed to go to an asteroid in the meantime, um, but I, I think Mars is really uh, the next thing uh, that will be a huge event like that. I think that the Google Lunar X Prize will be something that will capture people's imaginations, partially because there are lots of competing teams. It's a government-private collaboration. It's really a very exciting uh, prize competition. If you haven't heard about it, you can look it up. Uh, and also, I, I think if we see the signature of life uh, in around one of the exoplanets, uh, that will definitely get people's attention. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to say that, you know, on October 4th, 1957, was the best thing that ever happened. You know, the launch of Sputnik was the best thing that ever happened to US science and technology because it, it gave us a real a kick, kick in the pants. The US government saw how far behind the Soviet Union we were in science and technology and they started pouring huge amounts of money into universities for scientists and engineers and applied physicists and you know, computer programmers and stuff. And so it was an amazing event and we've, you know, had a fantastic half century since that time. I'm not sure what it's gonna be to launch us into another phase of growth like that. Maybe it'll be Mars, um, maybe the, the, the growth of um, the internet and stuff, but I think it has to be something actually that um, is perceived as either a threat from another country or, uh, well, I mean, that would do it, right? If, if a Chinese moon base might do it. Um, something that is either a, a, a security threat to the US or that shamefully places in our, puts, in our, puts, puts us in our place in terms of the perception, the world's perception of our place in science and technology as, as the launch of Sputnik did, basically. I mean, there's this thing beeping and out there and, and the US was nowhere close to that kind of technology at the time, or at least it wasn't known to the, to the typical person. And so um, I hope that there won't be a huge security threat that launches us in this direction. Uh, so I hope it's something that's, that's good, basically, like, like a Chinese moon base or another country going into orbit around Mars first or, or planning a lander. Uh, I'm in general for robotic missions, not for you know, human space flight, but I do admit that human space flight has the one advantage that it can actually capture the attention and the imagination of people who will then rally behind it. But it's very expensive, it's very dangerous, it's, it just makes a lot more sense to send robots, to tell you the truth. But I'm just not sure how much robots will, you know, will, whether they'll be as good as cap, at capturing the imagination and the support of the general public. Right, when people make the first trillion dollars in space, that'll also get the, yeah. the attention. Yeah. <laughs>
I was a little eager to liberate you, and we seem to have another 15 minutes, so. <laughs> yeah, because there's a, a half hour break after this anyway, so. You're quite right. Uh, so there's been a lot of talk about education. My name is Art Sussman, I'm a scientist, and my career has been all about K-12 education and public understanding of science. So I'd just like to let people in the room know that uh, there's been a national effort to develop what's called next generation science standards. And one of the things that's unique about those is that they have a big focus now on engineering. Uh, and uh, if you're from California, California actually has relatively terrible science standards. I was part of the process of trying to make them less terrible than they are. It was a political thing. And uh, this is, uh, the state is actually poised to develop, new, adopt new standards next July based on the next generation science standards. And I think the same reactionary forces will make their voices heard. And anything people here can do to push for adopting new science standards in California that are based on the next generation. Thank you. That's really great. I, I just want to add to that that I think it's very exciting that they've added uh, new respect for engineering disciplines uh, in the science standards. I think for too long we have um, had a, a major division between science and engineering that put uh, science up on a pedestal and engineering way down. I think that's a tremendous disservice uh, to education and also to engineering. So I think that's a great direction. Well, look at Howard on the Big Bang Theory and how much <laughs> he's teased by the other three physicists. <laughs> I'll, I'll repeat the question, yeah. Okay. Or, okay. Uh, the Higgs boson, uh, getting closer and closer to that, will that make a difference as far as uh, dark matter and dark energy, and as far as looking for it and making? Yeah, so uh, the question is about the Higgs boson, and um, you know, it's, it's this particle associated with a, a, a field, a hypothetical field, which is thought to end up determining the mass of all the fundamental particles based on, in a sense, the resistance they feel while traveling through this field, just to give an explanation to those who may not have heard of it. Um, and there, there's rumors that um, July 4th or so, around that time, there's going to be a big announcement from, the, from CERN and the Large Hadron Collider regarding the possible discovery of the Higgs boson. Um, that'll be really exciting if, if they've really found it. I mean, a few months ago there were already some announcements that they may have found it at not the highly statistically significant level, but nevertheless signs of it. And the rumor is, is that the statistical significance is going to be significantly higher in a week or so when they make this announcement. So that'll be really great. Um, I don't think the Higgs boson has much to do with the dark matter or the dark energy for sure, though. Um, the the dark energy is, is some sort of a new substance whose pressure is negative, and it's the negative pressure which in general relativity leads to a repulsion. So it has a positive mass density, but a negative pressure that dominates the positive mass density, and that's what causes space to ex expand faster and faster. And the Higgs boson simply does not have that property. Nor can the Higgs boson realistically be a candidate for the dark matter, because the dark matter, we have reasons to think, has to be a weakly interacting particle. It has to only interact through gravity, of course, and this so-called weak nuclear interaction. And again, the Higgs boson is simply not such a particle. So the Higgs boson is going to be fantastic if they find it. It's what the standard model of particle physics predicts is there, but I don't think that it'll have much uh, relevance to dark matter and dark energy. Some say that um, if they only find the Higgs, it would be a disaster. If they don't find the Higgs, that's very interesting. Actually, yeah, that's, that's right, yeah. I mean, I, what Pierre is saying is that some of us are actually hoping they don't find it, because if they don't find it, that'll, that'll make them go back to the drawing board. It'll be a revolution you know, in science, whereas if they do find it, it'll just be kind of what we expect them to find. I so. have a quick question for the panel. Uh, we are, after all, at the SETI Khan conference. We're talking about big revolution. Uh, what do you think would happen if we actually do detect a uh, signal from uh, an artificial, uh, an intelligent uh, civilization out there? 
So uh, I've, I've given some thought to this, and I think that the, the fact is that the scientific community would get it right away. Uh, and there's a, a large group of people that would scratch their heads over it and not really know what they thought about it and gradually become socialized into understanding that we're not the only intelligent species out there, or at least not, not the only life out there. Uh, but I also think that at, at one time it was believed that this would cause the religious community to sort of give it up. And I, I, think, I think that's not the case. I think that they've proven to be remarkably resilient about belief systems, and they would likely just include that in, the, uh, in their belief systems and, and press forward. Uh, I, I mean, it would be really exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it, I, I will also be fascinated where the detection comes from. I, I think that will be very interesting. Does it come from uh, anyone or does it come from SETI itself? Does it come from actually a, a different type of uh, detection that we've started doing? That's going to be really interesting. I, I think what's going to be great is all the conversations that are generated from it um, and how people react to it. So there are a lot of people um, who may or may not be religious who really don't think uh, that there's anything else out there that we are the only ones. Um, it's going to be really interesting to have conversations with them uh, about this and, and get their uh, insights and, and really get more of an understanding of um, how, they, how they grapple with this or, or do they just straight up deny it. Um, that's going to be just so great. I hope, I hope also it would be really great for budgets. I hope uh, SETI would get a lot more budget uh, after the detection. Um, I think you know, it's, it's difficult to stay patient and I'm a very impatient person, but it's difficult to stay pa uh, patient um, and continue pouring money into something uh, that's a, a very long-term thing. And so uh, I think it would be really great and it, it would be maybe similar to that Sputnik moment. You know, maybe not, yeah, we did it, but yeah, there's something out there and we should go explore more. Just briefly, um, I think, you know, scientists would be very excited and those who are knowledgeable about this would you know, think this is fantastic. But much of the world, I actually think, wouldn't care all that much because they're already convinced that UFOs are out there and have been detected and, <laughs> and farm girls in Kansas have been impregnated by the aliens and, and they or their, na their neighbors have been abducted and stuff. So such a giant fraction of the world already believes in visitations that they'll just say, you just got a signal? Big deal. <laughs> I grew up in Kansas. I did not get abducted. Oh, that's good. That's good. And I did not mean to imply that every farm girl in, in Kansas got abducted or impregnated. But, uh, but some claim that they did. Whereas, really, they were just having a fun time with their boyfriend in the haystack, you know. Uh, my name is Vincent Teofilo. I'm a uh, former fusion and fission plasma physicist. But uh, uh, after I told my employer 30 years ago that we wouldn't have tokamaks for another 50 years, uh, I was gainfully unemployed and been working on observatories the last 30. Uh, my question is to Alex with respect to uh, dark energy. When do you think we will be able to harness dark energy to create... <laughs> Never. Warp, warp, <laughs> warp bubbles or yeah. wormholes? Right, so, um, you know, never say never, right? But. Right now, my feeble mind cannot imagine harnessing dark energy at all. Um, especially if it ends up being just a property of space. Then it can't be gathered. Then it's not something you can collect and stick in, inside a box. And the measurements right now are entirely consistent with it being the cosmological constant. That is a property of space rather than some new field with an associated particle like the Higgs boson and the Higgs field. Um, so if it's just a property of space, then it, then it can't be harnessed. Um, and if it's not a property of space and can be harnessed, there's just so little of it, right? I mean, in this room it exists, but it has a completely negligible effect. It's only after you 
accumulate this stuff over distances of a hundred million light years or more that it begins to dominate over all the stuff that's gravitationally attractive. And so a hundred million light years is a, is a fairly large distance the last time I checked. Um, so I'm going to just say never, but I'm going to put that in quotes because, you know, never say never. <laughs> but, but, but since this is the, the science fiction and science conference, uh, Many of you have probably seen the Avengers movie, yeah? Uh, no, uh, okay, a few of you. Uh, the biggest problem I had with the Avengers movie was not that you've got all these superheroes and, and, and uh, all that. It's that you know, they try and harness dark energy in the Avengers, and so they've got this cube of dark energy, and it opens up a portal to space, and the aliens come and, and try and attack us. Uh, and the whole time I was going like, but if you harness dark energy, wouldn't it push the aliens further away? <laughs> they got the sign I, wrong. I couldn't. <laughs> the whole movie, I was going like, but this really doesn't make any sense. We have one last question. You have four minutes. Okay, uh, Gordon Myers, I have a question uh, about artificial intelligence. Uh, what do you think the interface between computers and human beings is still, even though their iPads break phones and grab his fingers and eyeballs? What kind of Good question. So uh, there's been quite a bit of work done on brain-computer interfaces, uh, much of it uninspiring so far in terms of results, but I think the direction is a great one. Um, clearly, the, the interface that we currently have with uh, a, a keyboard and a mouse and that kind of thing is a very low bandwidth interface. And in fact, um, I think that the, the biggest jump you're going to see in the immediate future is with the ability to delegate tasks to a smart associate. So you've seen just the, the tip of the iceberg uh, of that with Siri, but Siri came out of a DARPA project called Kalo, the cognitive assistant that learns and organizes, which is a very powerful set of technologies. And in fact, if you can delegate complex tasks to a computer, you don't have to type all the details. So I think in the near term, we'll have that. In the longer term, we'll have implants that will enable us to um, have a seamless interface with AIs. Yeah. Well, I want to thank the panel, but before we close, I have uh, a duty, a very pleasant duty to announce that uh, there will be an auction. I believe it is later today. I'm waiting for, for the details for time and location, space and time. Uh, there will be an auction to participate in a trip called Mission Mars on Earth, where you would actually go to the Antarctic or thereabouts. You know, the North Pole itself is sitting on water, so probably it's not where we'd go. But there is an expedition that is going to go to, to close to the North Pole to uh, investigate what, how would we be able to survive on Mars and, and do a, a scientific experiment over there. I personally went to the South Pole about uh, five years ago and spent 10 days there to look at some of the experiments that were done by some of my buddies at Stanford. And I highly recommend to do something like this. Now I have to tell you, after 10 days at the South Pole and I came back, in the taxi from the, from the airport to, to my hotel, I, every second I said, look, a tree, a tree, <laughs> a tree. <laughs> You, you get completely uh, blindsided when you're at the South Pole, or probably Antarctica will give you the same kind of uh, fantastic uh, experience. Where's Scott Hubbard? Is he abducted? Yeah. <laughs> the Mars Mars star is, is, is missing in action. Do you know when? Eleven today. Okay, eleven o'clock today. Uh, ballroom C. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. Thank you. Very good.
Neil's uh, was misspelled. Can you do one with mine too? Oh, Just sure, sure. Press sure. slowly on the big button and it'll focus correctly. You bet. Can you great. Yes, I will. Oh, that'd be great. Okay. One, two, three. One, another one? No, uh, press longer. It didn't okay. flash. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Great. Another one, another one. Oh, Ariel's okay. didn't flash. Right. Oh, yeah. did, did you get it? You should You got test. some red eyes, uh, Ariel. You're uh, going to have to correct that. Okay. <laughs> great. Thank you. And one with me and you sure. guys? Yes. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Did you get it? Okay. Now it's got the flash one. Oh. Yeah. Apparently hers didn't go. Oh. I'll do the best. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Three quarters. Thank you. One last one. So, <laughs> can I take two with this? Okay. <laughs> one, two. The flash. It shows good.